Welcome to Azure Firesight Chat. We are at NDC Oslo and I'm here with the one and only Scott Helm. Um, and we're going to talk about something, something security, I think, today. Something, so, something <laughs> um, No, actually, I want to start with um, the whole story of, of Azure and probably TLS. Like, a lot of it you get for free mm -hmm. on Azure, but I try installing certificates and it's a pain. Yeah, so HTTPS is kind of big now. Mm. And we... I think in the, the wider ecosystem as well, like we really need to see better support, better tooling. And we are seeing lots of cloud providers like starting to introduce integrations with, mm. you know, so like you don't have to go buy this, the certificate yourself and then come back and install it. What we kind yeah. of need is like a, I want some clicky buttons that will do the certificate yeah. thing for me. Because as a developer, I'm not really interested. Like it's something that should just be part of it. And if it isn't there, I'll just want to click a button, say enable. And it just isn't like that yet. And all, all of the other services that we have are kind of mirror that same thing, right? Like I use table storage like super extensively and I don't want to think about scaling the storage or, you know, load distribution or any of these things. Yeah. And it's like I want certificates and, and encryption to be like that same thing, right? Mm -hmm. It's like I just want to click the buttons and, and make it do the thing. Yeah. I don't want to think about I've got to go buy this and what's the configuration and where do I install it? I'm like, yeah. I just I just want it to work out of the box. And yeah. if we really want security to... To, to go like mainstream and just completely, like we want encryption everywhere, then it literally has to be at most like clicky buttons because we're not gonna get everyone in the world to learn about certificates and how to install them. So we no. just need to automate that away. Yeah, it just wanna be click, done, right? So you said table storage. What are you using table storage for? So yeah, we um, I run a, a company, a service online called Report URI, and we ingest uh, quite literally like billions and billions of reports a month. So we have uh, loads of inbound telemetry coming from our customers' websites, and when their visitors visit them, like things can go wrong, they can break, mm -hmm. and the browser will send telemetry back uh, in the form of a, a JSON payload. So we do like some processing and normalization, and then just pop that straight into table storage. Wow. So that's our, our data backend for that. We're doing probably, in, it's in the region of like several million, like single digit millions of transactions into table storage a day. I, I've been using that now for, gosh, it's like four and a half years or so, I oh, think, wow. something like that. And yeah, it's really cool. I was actually um, doing a, a talk here the other day and I was looking at the, the graph over the years and it's just like, boop, 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 boop. And I'm just like, this is amazing because I've done absolutely nothing during that time <laughs> apart from keep putting stuff in table storage. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, this, um, that's really cool. It's just super, super useful. Um, and the, the billing is like super friendly because it's just per transaction. So it, it's literally like pay for the thing that you use. And if we don't use it at a given time, or we have like a, a spike, I'm like, I don't have to do any load balancing or scaling. I just pay for more transactions. Yep. So yeah, it's really good. Yep. So you report your eye. So I know a little bit about, I'm guessing it's CSP, is it? Is that so, right? Yeah, that's one of the things. So uh, we have content security policy in the browser. Um, essentially, like super elevator pitch, mm -hmm. CSP is you can write a white list of the things that go on your website. So you write like the script source and you say, these are the places I love JavaScript from. It's like uh -huh. my own domain, code.jquery.com and wherever.com. Yep. And then the browser goes to your website and it's like, cool, I know all the scripts should come from these places. But then it gets down to the bottom of the page and there's a, a script tag and it has a source attribute that's like evil.com. <laughs> now, okay, like evil.com, we can look at that and be like, hey, this is bad. But yeah. the browser's just like, meh, it's a script tag, load it. Yeah, yeah. But with CSP, it's like, ah, oh, hang on a minute, like evil.com is not in the list mm -hmm. for the scripts. So it will block that script tag and then send a report back to your nominated reporting endpoint, which is what we do. And it's like, hey, I came to this page, you said only this script, but I found this script, so I blocked it and here's all the information. And then if you were to receive that report back as the site owner, you'd be like, hey, like, what is this evil.com thing on this page? And you can yeah. go and investigate that. So the first protection of CSP is like it blocked the script in the browser. So mm -hmm. if it was like a keylog or a malware or whatever, that, that was neutralized. Yep. But then for me, like just as important is the report that comes back because you still need to go fix your website if you have that script on there. Yeah. Because there was an example a few years ago, or maybe it was last year, you know, time tends to kind of be a bit... It, all <laughs> it does. Um, where there was a plugin that a lot of people use for accessibility that suddenly had, was it a bit mining something in yes. it? Yes, yeah. So this was, yeah, that was February last year. So um, a friend kind of... Uh, DM'd me and he's like, hey, I went to the ICO's website, which is the Information Commissioner's Office in the UK. There are mm. government data privacy watchdog organizations. So like <laughs> fairly important. Yeah. He's like, hey, I went to their website and things are running like super slow. I had a look in the console and there's like a bazillion errors in the console. Like, is what? this 
normal? Is this okay or whatnot? So I went and checked it out and there was loads of dodgy stuff going on in the console. And I was kind of like live tweeting this. And one of the things that I found was something called CoinHive, which is a oh, no. JavaScript library for mining cryptocurrency in the browser. Now they had like this fairly legitimate proposition that was like, no one likes ads. So you can have your website with no ads and you put our coin miner on there. And then when people come to your website, they, they might, you know, if they're on your website for 10 minutes, they yeah. spend 10 minutes mining cryptocurrency. And that's their payment instead yeah, of yeah. ads. And I'm like, okay, like, you know, like ethical and yeah, moral yeah, things yeah. aside, <laughs> like I, I can kind of see the proposition there. And it's like supposed to be done above board and you notify your users. Yeah. And what actually happened was like, hey, if I can get my coin mining script and put it on your website, then all of your visitors are mining coin for me. <laughs> <laughs> and this is what happened to the ICO. Like they ended up with someone getting this coin miner onto their website. And the initial thought is like, wow, they were compromised. Mm. And we carried on doing the investigation. Where is the script? How is it getting in the page? And then we realized that it was actually a third party plugin that they loaded called Browse Aloud, which is like a, a text to speech. So you yeah. drop this plugin on the page, you get a little speaker, you click it and it will read the page, which is awesome for accessibility and, and why but, so yeah. many government websites had it. And there was literally almost 5,000 of them. And, and I, you know, we were doing this investigation throughout the day and live tweeting what we were finding. And yeah, they, like we never actually found out how the third party was compromised. The, okay. the script file was hosted in, in, S, in S3. So I was like, maybe they had weak creds or someone found their creds or something, but somehow someone got into their hosting change the script file and then of course like if you're just like hey go load the script file it's like mm. hey go load the coin miner because the third party script changed and that's yeah. how that's like a far more efficient target for the attackers because if you can change that one script file and that script file goes on 5,000 sites mm. you don't have to go compromise 5,000 sites you only have to compromise one so it's a far better return and we're seeing a lot more attacks like that now going after the JavaScript supply chain rather than going after just the one host yeah. Well, you get, you know, scalability, right, for your attack yeah, really exactly. quickly. It's just, and the reason I asked that is because that, that comes back to the CSP, the, you know, content security policy that you were talking about, and that all comes into Azure, and that, it, did that, does that kind of stuff just balloon your service? Like, does it just massively scale up in terms of what the data you're using? Yeah, so one of the really great things, like I say, about table storage is, you know, where I started Report Your Eyes a free project years and years and years ago, and... I was like, I'm not a database person, and nor do I want to learn like no. all of the many, many skills required to be a database person. So I knew I was going to use a cloud service to, to kind of like offload this responsibility and do this properly. And yeah, literally since like day one, like in our first month, all of those years ago, I think we did like eight and a half thousand reports in a, in a whole month. So we had like eight and a half thousand JSON yep. payloads come in. And like I'm still using the exact same table storage setup as I was then, right now. Like nothing has changed, but now at our peak, we're doing like 28,000 reports a second. So we like <laughs> last month we did we did 8.7 billion JSON payloads. That's about 16 terabytes of JSON that came in in a month. 16 terabytes. 16 terabytes of JSON yeah. came into us, and it's like, but I I've never changed table storage. It's like it's exactly the same connection string and interface that was there like four and a half years ago. So where do I go to find out about Report URI if I want to use the service? Um, so report-uri.com is our main domain. It's probably okay. got all of the information to get started. Um, like we do free accounts and like none of this like credit card nonsense to sign up. Like you can just register and start using it and poking yep. around with things until you get 10,000 reports a month for free, which is, you That's know, good. it's good enough to like get a feel for what it does and how it works. And then essentially we just have like a little slider as you need more and more reports <laughs> and you just slide this. It's like the cloud the button. The cusp button's on the back. <laughs> Shh, don't tell them all. <laughs> so yeah, no, it's, um, we have the free tier account there so people can like really kind of stretch its legs without having to pay and it's not until you get into like reasonable volumes of reports that the cost really starts to kick in but then you know like if you're getting up to that level then you're usually a pretty big site so it's kind of all relative um, but other than that like if people are interested in our infrastructure and how we do things I've got those three kind of major architectural changes that we did I've blogged them all so I'm completely open about it we've um, you know we've got like infrastructure diagrams and stuff on how we do this and I have a couple of posts actually on like hacking table storage. So not like hacking from a, a security sense, no, 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 but hacking from like a, the traditional term of, yeah, of like yeah. making it do things that it didn't normally do. Because there are some limitations with querying table storage. One of them for us was like, if you're collecting all the reports of these sites and you want to do a search on a path, so you want to, you know, you go in and you're like, right, show me reports for scotthelm.co.uk. And then, oh, just show me reports in like the slash account section, because yeah, I want to yeah, see yeah. this part. But there's no, 
you know, there's no like operator or anything SQL like in table storage. Yeah. And, and it wasn't until kind of about eight months ago, whenever it was, this became a problem. And we found that we can do like crazy combinations of like greater than or equal to less than or equal yeah, to string right. operators on particular properties. And it's like, hey, we built like a, a like query in <laughs> table storage. Yeah. So yeah, yeah it's, it's, like, <laughs> it's like, yeah, it's, it now does this thing that it doesn't support natively. And I'm like, oh, this is really cool. So yeah, yeah there's a couple of things on there as well about stuff like that, where we've um, stretched the functionality of table storage a little bit just to, you know, just to help us out. So. Oh, Don't tell Microsoft. <laughs> no, it's all fine. I'm sure they. I'm sure they'll be okay with it. Yeah. Uh, cool. Best of luck with your talk tomorrow, Thank Scott. You. And uh, thanks for being on the show, man. Cheers. Cheers. Cheers.